Hi, it's Dwyer of DwyerCrime.blog. Today is Wednesday, January the 23rd, 2019. I'm making this video to follow up on my most recent video on the Stephen Avery case. Uh, for those of you interested in the case, I encourage you to go back and look at the other videos I've posted on the case going back several months. Now let's discuss the case, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now in my last video, I directed viewers to a podcast by Nancy Grace, who apparently their mixed feelings about among many of you, right? And in the podcast, Nancy Grace points out that she spoke with Stephen Avery shortly after Teresa Hallback went missing, that Avery lied to her, right? Said things that demonstratively were not true, right? Also, Nancy Grace plays a portion of Brandon Dassey's confession where the police appear to be giving Dassey ample opportunity, and I mean ample opportunity, to take back some incriminating statements or to at least to explain them more fully, right? During the portion on Nancy's podcast, they're not putting words in his mouth. And Dassey talks in great detail about the cutting of Teresa Hallback's neck and other facts that, quite frankly, only a participant in the crime would know. Right? Keep in mind, there's more to Brandon Dassey's confession than simply the portion where the police officer asks who shot her in the head. Right? You actually have a lot of the confession that did not make it onto the Netflix show, right? Finally, I talked about how a third party witness, in fact, he's a friend of Earl Avery, was actually present, right? The afternoon, a little before five o'clock, the afternoon Teresa Hallback goes missing. And, of course, he's with Stephen Avery. There's burning plastic in the burn barrel. Stephen Avery is there, right? And, of course, we later find out that the burning plastic was Teresa Hallback's phone. Or, at least, Teresa Hallback's phone ends up burnt in that burn barrel. So, you have a third-party friend of the family that is not law enforcement, he's not part of the state, doesn't have anything to do with any lawsuit involving Stephen Avery against the state, and he's telling you that the day the victim goes missing, Avery is right by the burning burn barrel where the victim's phone is later found. Then, of course, there's the issue of several members of Stephen Avery's own family seeing him tending to the burn pit later at night. And, of course, in the burn pit were parts of Teresa Hallback's clothing and body. So, people are passionate about the case. I understand many of you feel that he's an innocent man. Right? We'll overlook the fact that an underage relative previously accused him of sexual assault. We'll overlook the fact that he once threw a live cat into the burn pit fire. Right? We'll overlook all that. Right? Many of you feel that he's an innocent man, and I'll also say this too. No matter how despicable someone has been in the past, Right? They shouldn't be convicted for crimes that they did not commit. I'll agree with that. Right? So, 
As you can imagine, just reading the comments section of the earlier video where many of you left comments, I got some colorful comments, right? Here's one from Gail, a YouTube viewer. This is the stupidest crap I have ever heard, right? Here is one from Christina Townsend. The Steve who called, and this is the call that Teresa Hallback's phone received at 4.35 p.m., the day she goes missing, right? Keep in mind, Nancy Grace maintains that the call comes from Stephen Avery. And so what he told her about the timeline is a complete lie. Stephen Avery calls Teresa Hallback's phone two hours, two hours after Teresa Hallback visits him. Right? Think about it. Keep in mind, Bobby Dassey sees Teresa Hallback taking photos of the vehicle. Right? Two hours after Teresa Hallback has visited with Stephen Avery and is seen walking to her trailer. Right? The witness is Bobby Dassey. Right? Stephen Avery calls Teresa Hallback's phone, possibly to set up an alibi, to say, hey, she never showed up. Well, Christina Townsend says the Steve who called was Steve Schmitz, not Stephen Avery. That's been proven. Nancy Grace is a joke. She was disbarred for being unethical. She is a proven liar. Avery's story has been consistent from the beginning. Now we're going to get back to these statements by Christina Townsend. But let me also point out that others here have come up with their own theories of the case. So here is a YouTube viewer called Entrusted. E-N, that's the first word. The next word's trusted. He says, Avery's family, Bobby Dassey, had reason to incriminate Avery if Bobby is the killer. Brandon Dassey is so detailed. And let me point out that if you listen to the Nancy Grace podcast, you realize he's detailed. Brandon Dassey is so detailed. He probably watched something similar on Bobby's sick porn. But there's not a single shred of evidence to back it up. The police had the bones November the 8th, 2005, and knew there was a bullet hole in the skull bone. That's why they asked Brendan what happened to her head. They're trying to get him to say what they know. They lead him into it. And you keep saying just the facts. Were you there? Evidence has to make sense down to the atomic level. And the evidence does not pass common sense or scientific scrutiny. When a bullet goes through bone twice, it better have bone on it. I feel you aren't being objective in the least. It's hard to listen to. All right. Well, let's just address some points here because I think they need to be addressed. As I've said in the past, there's so much evidence here. There's so much evidence here that it's evidence overload. So I believe people will then start questioning one part of the evidence. Brandon Dassey's confession. Was it real? Did he know what he was talking about? Did the police plant the story with him and get him to repeat it on camera? Right? Or Stephen Avery's blood. 
which is in multiple places in Teresa Hallback's car, which of course is under some branches on the Avery property. Right? People want to say, hey, is there such a thing as sweat DNA? Stephen Avery's blood, is there the possibility that this blood was planted? And what I think happens is people lose the bigger picture. Right? The picture of the absence of an alibi by Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery's own lies to people like not just Nancy Grace, but to law enforcement. Right? Other objective pieces of evidence. The gun used happens to be Stephen Avery's gun. The level of detail in Brandon Dassey's confession, which is on film, where he's telling the police things the police don't even know. The timeline of Stephen Avery's statements before Teresa Hallback's body parts are found in his burn pit. Stephen Avery goes out of his way to distance himself from the burn pit. So what I want to do here, just to point out the level of misinformation in the case, is I want to go back to Teresa Townsend's statement to me here in the comment section of the earlier video. She says the Steve who called was Steve Smits, not Stephen Avery. That's false. Right? Understand, we have phone records. It's not some other customer who Teresa Hallback was supposed to visit and photograph their car. That's not the evidence. Folks, when you make a phone call, it registers when you don't use star 67. And guess what? The only call where Stephen Avery did not use star 67 that afternoon was the 4.35 p.m. call. He calls Teresa Hallback's phone at 4.35 p.m. Right? Keep in mind, he tells Nancy Grace a different timeline where she's supposed to have left by 2.30. He's calling her two hours later, and it's him. Right? That's what the phone records indicate. Not some other customer in some other location. Also, the statement, Nancy Grace is a joke. She was disbarred for being unethical. Folks, understand the State Bar of Georgia actually has a website here online. You can Google it where you can just plug in someone's name, an attorney in Georgia you know, and the site will tell you their contact information as well as whether or not they're a member in good standing. To this day, Nancy Grace is a member in good standing with the Georgia State Bar. I don't know where folks have gotten this storyline that Nancy Grace is supposed to have been disbarred or that she's unethical. More importantly, I don't even understand the attacks on Nancy Grace when there's an audio tape recording of her conversation with Stephen Avery. Understand, you don't have to rely on Nancy Grace's credibility when there's a taped statement from Stephen Avery. At that point, the focus should be on whether what Avery is saying is true. That should be the focus. So when you hear Avery's voice lying to Nancy Grace, right, claiming that Teresa Hallback leaves his property at 2.30, and then there's this 4.35 call. You have to question the credibility of Stephen Avery. 
Nancy Grace's background has nothing to do with it. There are no allegations that the tape is tampered with in any way, shape, or form. Understand too, if Nancy Grace were to have tampered with the tape, Stephen Avery would have one hell of a defamation lawsuit. Didn't happen. Stephen Avery's lying to Nancy Grace. Let me point out to Christina Townsend writes, Avery's story has been consistent from the beginning. Folks, it hasn't been. In his early statements, he claims that he was in bed that night by 9 p.m. Folks, these statements are out there. 9 p.m. Believe it or not, he called Jody Brennan that night. They talked. Right? He... <laughs> we know the 9 p.m. story is not true. Let me also say too, in his earlier statements, he claimed he hadn't used the burn barrel or the burn pit recently. We know that's not true. Several people saw him using both, right? Robert Fabian, again, family friend, not law enforcement is with him by the burning burn barrel that afternoon right family members family members see him by the burn pit that night that's inconsistent with his initial statements you have to ask yourself, who do you believe? Let me also say this too, and I don't say it lightly. Let's be careful here with who we suggest did this crime. If you're going to try to accuse someone other than Stephen Avery. Right? Understand. Take the Kennedy assassination. Right? If you believe that the autopsy documents were doctored, then to me, that suggests that the people behind the assassination are high level. So it doesn't make sense to accuse, let's say, a co-worker of Lee Harvey Oswald's. Right at that stage, quite frankly, if the autopsy photos are doctored, I believe it's hard to even accuse Lee Harvey Oswald, right? Because the level of sophistication needed to doctor the autopsy photos would suggest a conspiracy. Well, Kathleen Zellner, Avery's lawyer, has recently started suggesting that Bobby Dassey might be the killer, right? That Bobby Dassey is lying about seeing Teresa Hallback walking towards Stephen Avery's trailer after taking photos of the vehicle. Right now, let's just think it through. The first season of Making a Murderer, they tried to convince you that it was the state, didn't they? Wasn't the argument that Stephen Avery had a whale of a lawsuit against the state for being falsely imprisoned for a crime he did not commit? Wasn't that the theory? So you had Avery's lawyers suggesting that law enforcement did things like withdrew blood that Stephen Avery had given police, planted the blood in Teresa Hallback's vehicle. Isn't there blood in Teresa Hallback's vehicle? They even tried to show you blood containers 
and tried to suggest that the hole in the top where the blood went into the container was actually a hole that, you know, was used to take blood out of the container. We were supposed to believe that it's because of the sophistication of law enforcement and the millions of dollars in legal liability to Stephen Avery that were at stake that law enforcement would do things like transport body parts or bones to Stephen Avery's burn pit. Right? That law enforcement was savvy enough to plant the car the car that had left Stephen Avery's property to plant the car back on Stephen Avery's property and that law enforcement was savvy enough to then plant Stephen Avery's blood in the car. Right? Law enforcement even was able to take the gun off Stephen Avery's wall, fire some shots, and then plant those bullets in the garage, right? Isn't that the theory of the case? The first year of making a murderer? Isn't that what they want us to believe? That this is a conspiracy involving sophisticated players with access to the evidence who could do things like move her car onto Avery's property plant Avery's blood, move bones to Avery's burn pit, burn the body someplace else without being detected. Well, folks, now things have really gotten crazy. Now Avery's own attorney is trying to change the script a bit and suggest that Bobby Dassey might be responsible for the murders. Does Bobby Dassey have the sophistication to pull this off? To frame Avery to the point where he even has Avery's blood and he's able to plant Avery's blood in Teresa Hallback's vehicle which he somehow is able to transport onto the property without anybody seeing him? Don't people in the area know Bobby Dassey? Wouldn't it be the kind of thing where you're a neighbor and you look over and Bobby Dassey is in Teresa Hallback's car? Wouldn't you be able to tell the cops not, you know, the person was 5'10 and 180 pounds? Wouldn't you, in fact, be able to say, you know, it was Bobby Dassey driving the car? I've lived here, I'm a member of the family, etc. Yeah, that, that's cousin Bobby driving the car. Right? How come no one, no one, no one has been able to adequately explain how Bobby Dassey could have done this crime and then would have had access to Stephen Avery's blood to be putting it in the car and how Bobby Dassey would even get Teresa Hallback's car. She's not visiting him. Right? She's not visiting him. How would Bobby Dassey even have the ability to get Teresa Hallback's car and then to drive it unto Stephen Avery's property. Let's ask another question too. How would Bobby be able to know that Brandon Dassey would then come up with a story that involves Stephen Avery? Also, what would Bobby Dassey's motivation be? Right? Is he in cahoots with the state? Is the state, has the state recruited him to get involved because they want to save millions of dollars in liability to Stephen Avery? I mean, understand, Bobby Dassey doesn't have a multi-million dollar motive here. 
Also, think about the risk involved. The burn pit is not far from Stephen Avery's trailer. Right? If you're going to be dropping bones in the burn pit, right, aren't you running the risk of Stephen Avery saying, Bobby, what the hell are you doing over there by the burn pit? Keep in mind, too, there are other people who saw Stephen Avery himself by the burn pit that night. Doesn't that rule out anyone else being by the burn pit that night? So, you know, I'm amazed. I have to be blunt here. I understand everyone has a strong opinion People are passionate here. I understand the Making a Murderer series has been on for a while and people are invested in it. Right? Okay, fair enough. But wow. You know, let's at least be coherent, can we? Robert Fabian, the witness who's with Stephen Avery at the burn barrel the afternoon Teresa Hallback goes missing. What's his motivation to lie about that? Let's talk about the bullets, too. You know, 10 casings were found. Understand, I, I keep hearing about bullet not having bone on it. What about the other bullets, folks? She was shot more than once. Right? We don't have the body, we have the bullets. Right? You, you can't try to say, hey, this bullet doesn't have bone on it without talking about the other casings. Can you? Right? Why are we just trying to focus on part of the picture without looking at the entire picture. Let's ask another question because this is provable. Why would Stephen Avery use Star 67? The first two times he calls Teresa Hall back the afternoon she goes missing and then not use Star 67 in the 435 call. Worse yet, why is he lying to Nancy Grace? We know he's lying. We have the phone records. Why is he lying to Nancy Grace? And why did he lie to authorities when he's first questioned? Right? He's in bed by nine. Then we find out he's been on the phone. Then we find out other people saw him even later than that by the burn pit. Why is he lying? Why the inconsistency? Add it all up, and I believe Stephen Avery is guilty as sin. What I hope happens here, let's keep the dialogue going, right? Because it's really about a public discussion. That's what I'm trying to spur with this website. Rather than tell me I'm full of it, um, I haven't researched the case, um, you know, I'm crazy, uh, this is the craziest thing you've heard, and stuff like that. In the comment section of this video, why don't you actually discuss how Bobby Dassey is supposed to have pulled this off? Why Stephen Avery's legal team has gone from first accusing the state to now accusing almost anybody who was in the area, right? Before it's the state, they're trying to save millions of dollars. Now suddenly it's some family member who's supposed to be in a porn. Right? A guy who, by the way, the timeline doesn't match in the slightest. People actually see him driving away. Right? At a time when it wouldn't have been, time-wise, possible for him to have done the crime. Right? Why is Stephen Avery's own team changing the story here? 
Also, Brandon Dassey. Okay, I've heard enough about the cops saying, who shot him in the head? Okay, great. Tell us where in the other parts of his lengthy confession the police put words in his mouth. Right? Lay it all out here. Folks can check. Believe it or not, you actually have transcripts and tapes of the confession here online. Right? I see a young kid, and I, I quite frankly, am not buying. The idea that he is so slow, he didn't know what he was doing was wrong and stuff like that. I'm not buying that at all. This is a guy who helps clean up the crime scene. Right? I see a young kid who, if you believe he's slow, how does he remember so many details about the murder? Right? Think it through. Let me also say, too, could the cops have done a better job in general in evidence collecting? Sure. Can't you say that about almost every case? So the cops weren't perfect. If you believe the cops, the state, frame Stephen Avery, Tell us where they get the blood from to put it in his car. Is it blood they collected from Stephen Avery? Did Avery just happen to cut his head right around the time that Teresa Hallback goes missing? Let me also say this too. At 2.27 p.m. that day, we know this. Teresa Hallback calls her employer and says, I'm on my way over to the Avery house. 227. Right? Just understand that Avery himself has a different timeline that he tells Nancy Grace. How come his timeline doesn't even match Teresa Hallback's phone records? Right? Let me hear from you. I look forward to your comments. Let it rip. Thanks for stopping by.